Hey, welcome to week four. You've made it. Already been a part of three weeks, and this is week four of Better Together. I want to thank you for committing to the time to be a part of a, of a life group. It's just really great to have you in these small groups. And I want to say thanks to your facilitators and to the host homes for making themselves available, making their homes available for us to have this time together. This past Sunday, we looked at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I think the best way to jump in is just to read the passage again. This is what it says. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Uh, this passage of scripture uh, has so much to teach us. Uh, we've already learned of this sense of community in the in the early church they, they had the best leaders imaginable in the 12 apostles and now all of a sudden in the midst of this phenomenal growth this dispute this complaint arises that threatens to split the church they were growing in a way that could only be attributed to the power of the holy spirit and yet they had problems what we know is that God always has had a heart for the widows and the orphans. You can uh, look at 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 16 and see more about that. But in the New Testament culture, widows often were left destitute. They had no family, no means of support. So the church was trying to meet those needs. Uh, Amy Carmichael, a missionary to India once pointed out to her critics about her ministry to the needy people of India, her ministry to the physical needs of those people. She said, souls are securely fastened to bodies. And that's true. Uh, this distribution of food, uh, when you began to look at the original language, this was basically just a charitable giving, uh, providing for some just basic food for these widows and it had come to be a problem because people were being overlooked based on a low-level problem of supervision. By low level, I don't mean that what was happening wasn't important. I mean that you have the apostles up here organizing, but down here, they failed to have the systems they needed. They failed to have the volunteers they needed. They failed to have the organization they needed to make sure that not everybody to make sure that nobody was overlooked. I want to remind us that every church, especially a growing church, is going to have problems. Note that this problem arises out of ministry. It was because they were trying to serve the Lord by meeting the needs of these widows that there was conflict. Christians often naively get involved in serving the Lord with the assumption that Everyone will get along since we're all doing the Lord's work. Well, most of us know that's not true. But I just want to reemphasize that. Uh, it's often when we try to serve the Lord together, when we try to meet basic needs, when we decide to, that we're going to share material resources, and through that system we create, that conflicts erupt. We, we tend to overlook people. It, it happens. Um, it would never have happened if they had not been serving the Lord. And it's shocking, isn't it, to discover that the Lord's other servants do not all agree with the way that I'm doing things? It's normal. It's just part of the way this process works. And then there's the whole question, did the apostles think they were above this? Did they, they're not capable of, of being involved? I mean, they're just trying to pass it off to someone else? 
No, rather they're they're pointing out that uh, their ministry, their calling, uh, demands a certain amount of attention to certain things. They were leading a spiritual development of thousands and the evangelism of ten thousands. I've never led such a large movement, but even in leading all sizes of churches, I realize that uh, if I'm not careful, I soon will get way too involved in things that I shouldn't get involved in. And I will miss the priorities of prayer and the ministry of the word. My first church was in Cleo Springs, Oklahoma, and the parsonage was right by the church. And, um, you know, part of the pastor's jobs in such a small congregation included doing the weekly bulletin. So glad I don't have to do that anymore. I also mowed and maintained the church lawn. And um, what I found myself doing over time was I spent more and more time. We had a beautiful lawn. We actually drilled our own little well. That's a whole nother story. I love mowing the grass. You know one reason? It was a lot easier to mow the grass than it was to lead the church in the direction it needed to. You know, that ministry of the word and prayer is really a top priority. And so I identify with this. And I think part of the lesson is reminding us of what our pastoral staff is called to do. Acts 6.2 says, they said, it's not wise for the apostles to turn away from their calling to serve tables. The point is not that such service is beneath them, but they need support in order to fulfill their spiritual calling. And even after they appointed the seven, it wasn't the seven who were going to do all this alone. It was going to take everyone, the entire church, sharing in their gifts, sharing together to make sure that they did not overlook these very, very valuable people who God loved. I think one way I could help us focus today and really share my heart is to just share the story of my parents. My mom and dad retired at the early uh, age of 57 and 58. And they moved from Western Oklahoma to Eastern Oklahoma where they had grown up their ancestral home, even the town, the church in which they were married. They went there. One of the main reasons was the Henrietta First Church of the Nazarene. Uh, they loved that church. They loved the fellowship of that church. They got involved in, at every level. I remember my dad began to teach Sunday school. One of his things he loved to do was visit in the nursing homes. And they were very involved. And they, they loved the trips, the times away with everyone. But in the late 1990s, my father developed um, uh, renal failure. And he then began to have episodes of uh, light strokes. He had vascular dementia. My family and I all began that slow goodbye, which eventually, this disease eventually took my father's life. The church was only one block away from their house. And although they had been really involved in the church, they had served, they had been a part of it. Although the pastor, the staff, the members reached out to them through those long months when, and years when my dad was on dialysis and my mom was a caregiver, uh, months turned to years, change of pastorates, the heavy weight of caring for my father increased. I know my mom often felt overlooked. I had trouble evaluating if she really was or if that was just where she was coming from. And she sometimes would say, you know, that nobody checks on us. The pastor never calls on us. And I would remind her, you know, I would say, mom, you know, sometimes people say that about me. And, and I think there's a whole lot more to pastoring than maybe you're aware of. But it was a reality. She felt overlooked and she probably was overlooked. At the same time, I still know, I knew that several members of that congregation still checked on her. And then my dad passed away. And so after he passed away, she transitioned to being this uh, single widow. And I knew she hoped that she could uh, die and go be with my father. But God kept her, and she grew older and grow, grew older, and as she got into her 90s, dementia came to her. And um, changes of pastor, she wasn't that involved. Uh, there was a lessening of contact. There were times when she just felt nobody cared about her. At the same time, I still know there were 
several members of that congregation who would check on her. And it's to that congregation we went to when we needed somebody to, to look in upon her, when we couldn't find anybody to help us. So I, I want to celebrate the Henrietta Church of the Nazarene. They were doing a good job of caring for my mom. But it's normal, as she was gone and not present and grew older, there were times when I know she felt overlooked and probably was overlooked. I would say um, that I'm very aware that there are those who are a part of our church family who are overlooked in these days. I know it's true. I know our best attempts at trying to care for them. I, I don't know that we always, uh, we, we do some, but we can always do better. I know that for my mom, even now that I've moved her here, she still receives cards and even phone calls from some of the people of Henrietta Church of the Nazarene. And I'm sharing this story to remind us all that there are those around us who once were regular, faithful, attending, active members of Prescott Church of the Nazarene, and they're not able to do that now. And I want to be honest with you that oftentimes we don't know where everybody is. COVID, I know we blame everything on COVID, but COVID didn't help. So hard to know who's still here, who's moved away, where they're at. I share this to remind myself and to remind all of us that there are those who, just like in the book of Acts, well, they're being overlooked. Um, I share this with you because I think we need to find ways to make sure that we're going to address those who are feeling overlooked. There are complaints. That happens. Happens in every church. Happened in every church I pastored. And I want to remind us that part of the lesson in this is that the complaint in this particular story, nobody made a formal complaint. Nobody sent an email. Nobody came in and talked to a pastor. Nobody necessarily did that. There was just this rumbling underneath the surface, just you know, sharing this with other people. I'm saying that because the first thing I want to happen from this video is if you know someone who being overlooked, I want you to tell me. I want you to write their name down, their phone number, their address. I want you to email me, uh, Pastor Ira at PrescottNaz.com, or write it on a piece of paper or put it on a connect card and let me know because one of the things I want to have happen after this particular week a Better Together is that we uh, make sure our list of those who are homebound is complete so we can care for them. Uh, I invite you to let us know those you know who need to be added to our Heart to Home list. Heart to Home is our ministry that's intended to stay connected with them and reach out to them. Help us update our list so we can take the next step. I also realized that we need our seven. Uh, I think the Lord for Susie Turn Turntine and how, how she's a part of this church and how uh, she has the heart for heart to home. But Susie can't do that alone. Susie needs her other six people that can join her who have similar strengths, but also have different strengths, administrative strengths. And together, I think we could create a a good group of leaders that would oversee Heart to Home that would help us make sure we're not overlooking those in our congregation as they've not been able to attend or as they're growing older. And then I would, I would do one more. I, would you perhaps be willing to take some time each week and make a phone call to our homebound? Now, part of the challenge is they often don't answer the phone. But I learned this during COVID when I made a lot of phone calls I found out that when I did get through to them, we had amazing conversations and we were able to pray on the phone together. Would you be willing to build a relationship? First of all, maybe through a phone call. But some of you need to take a, another step. Maybe when it's appropriate, you could do this through a personal visit in their home or in an adult care facility. You need, we need to make sure their family's aware who's coming to see them. You know, now that I'm a uh, uh, an adult child of a woman with dementia. I kind of want to know who sees my mom. I, I want to be aware. So keeping good communication with their family. I think personal visits in their home is a really important thing that we could do. 
And then one last thing is, would you be available perhaps to help with transportation? Uh, a lot of times seniors shouldn't be driving. Maybe that's uh, drive them to church and to home, drive them to the grocery store, drive them to a doctor's appointment. If so, if you could help in any of these areas, would you let me know? We created cards this past Sunday and put them in the bulletin so that help you respond to these three areas. But would you pray about being a part? And uh, would you bring that card back to us? Or if you're not willing, you don't want to mess with the card, just email me at pastorira at prescottnaz.com. I'll be meeting with Susie and a few others here in the weeks to come. And we're going to try to do a better job in this area. One last thing before you get to your discussion questions. We've been doing Warm for Winter for a number of years. I love this ministry. We gather up coats and we distribute them widely through the community. This week, we discovered that our inventory of coats does not meet the, de meet the demand of coats. We have lots of coats, but we don't have the right sizes. We especially need coats for children. You can help in two ways. You can, first of all, donate money and just designate it warm for winter. And then we can go buy coats and make sure we have enough coats for the children and uh, other families and people in our community that really don't have everything they need. We, we intend to go shopping at Costco and Walmart this week to get a number of children coats we need to meet the needs of families in need in the Quad City area. Um, and you know, what I learned even this week is while we're trying to do this ministry, there are complaints. There's people who feel like we're overlooking them in our community. Um, we will continue to do it and we'll continue to learn from the complaints. You've overlooked us. You didn't communicate effectively enough. These are all things that happen in every organization, but we're committed to this concept that we're better together. Um, I just want to thank you for being a part of this study. God bless you. Uh, please take time to work through the discussion questions in your group. A lot of the, some of the questions will have to do directly from the message and some will have to do about uh, this particular application of the message. But we'll see you next week and better together. God bless.